My objectives this year uh, are to be able to work through the differential diagnosis of a patient with thick walls, give you the practical clues that will come out of your history exam, and especially echo imaging uh, to aid in the further clinical evaluation of these patients. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is probably the way I got involved in a lot of these other cardiomyopathies because a lot of patients come to the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic where I've spent a lot of my career. And they come with thick walls, and we don't always know that they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is a monogenic cardiac disease that has a fairly high prevalence. We used to think, I mean, when I was in medical school, I was led to believe we would only see this a couple times in our career. Of course, I spend my practice now in the hypertrophic clinic, but I think all cardiologists see this regularly. If one in 500 people walking around in any given area will probably have the gene. Uh, maybe it's even as, as common as 1 in 250, but that's debatable. Variable penetrance and expression make this difficult to uh, follow because it doesn't always express itself the same, even though the same gene may be uh, present in the same family member. So you could have one, pa one family member with the reverse curve uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, another with apical variant, and they have the same gene. So it really doesn't explain the morphology that we see. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is de defined by the presence of increased wall thickness of greater than 15, unexplained by abnormal loading conditions that could cause that, and also other conditions, and that's where we're going to spend the emphasis of this talk. About 60% of our patients, maybe even up to 70% in today's um, uh, genetic av availability, and it's growing all the time. Every time I give this talk, I have to look how many genes are out there now. But about 60% of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will have a defined gene if you send their blood in and get the genetic analysis. But there are limitations still to our techniques in genetics. There's genes that we probably have not yet defined that could if impact not only the sarcomeric genes, which I'm showing you here, but these Z-band genes are affected by the genetics of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then there's the, the mimics of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we, we as imagers are often the first people to think about this, and as clinicians, we have to often work through the patients that have thick walls. So I'm going to start with a case that I have to admit many of us have um, tried to figure out. So it's a, a gentleman, 60, 69 years old, who has dyspnea chest pain and pre-syncope, especially if he eats a, a meal before he goes for his walk with his dog. He feels very lightheaded and, and, and very much more dyspneic. He has a complicated past medical history of multiple myeloma, which was diagnosed in 1995. He was status post a uh, stem cell autologous transplant in 1996, and then again again in 2012. He has end-stage kidney disease. Um, he's, his free light chains were checked, and they were negative. And he's been very hypertensive with difficult to control blood pressures. I'm just showing you your e the EKG here, because whenever you have thick walls, you want, always want to look for the obvious clues out there. And EKG and chest x-ray, which I'm not showing you, are part of the physical exam in my book. And his ECG uh, may be a borderline case for LVH in this situation, so that might be somewhat reassuring given his past history of multiple myeloma, negative light genes at this point. And here's his echocardiogram, parasternal long axis view. You're going to see here thick walls. Um, you can see that he's got, he's older. He's got calcium in his mitral and aortic annulus. He's got a narrowed outflow tract. He's got an aberrant muscle bundle underneath the septum here. And his walls measured 16 millimeters. His, his pictures are a little bit better from the apical windows. You can see in the apical long axis view here that he has significant systolic anterior motion, significant mitral annular calcification. Minimal, uh, there's maybe some mitral or aortic valve stenosis, but it wasn't significant. Uh, hemodynamically, you can see in the, uh, the two-chamber view that he's got thick walls all the way around his heart, although the septum is more thick than the other walls. So he does have asymmetric septal hypertrophy. At rest, he's got a gradient of 21. And with Valsalva or provoked maneuvers, he went up to 66 millimeters of mercury. So I'll ask you to key in your answers. What do you think this is his diagnosis? Hypertensive heart disease because it was hard to control blood pressure? Is it amyloid cardiomyopathy? Is this history of multiple myeloma? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you saw the very asymmetric septal hypertrophy with an aberrant cord. Um, can we put the audience poll? And, uh, or could these be, or could he have all three? Or do you need more information?
Okay, I was expecting kind of a big split. So all three, and everyone's a really good test taker, and this is a really bad question if you're writing test <laughs> exam questions because you're always going to pick either all three or more information. But it, you're absolutely right. It could be all three, and that's kind of where we were. And you do need more information. So this gentleman was recommended to get a cardiac biopsy, but he, he declined. And uh, so we're stuck. We don't really exactly know what he has, but we do know some of the hemodynamics we need to address with him. We need to get his blood pressure under control, owning back to Rick's lecture a few minutes ago, and we need to uh, try to make him less hyperdynamic, and we'll, we'll keep on working with him to see if he might succumb to a biopsy. He couldn't get a cardiac MRI because of his renal failure. So hypertrophy, uh, we're going to see most commonly genetic origin, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that can be due to hemodynamics, loading conditions, even exercise and very elite athletes, and even renal failure can give increased wall thickness. It can be infiltrative, and you're going to hear a lot about this. Many people over the years have questioned whether Mayo Clinic cardiologists have a diastolic cult. At the end of this conference, I'm going to ask you, is it a diastolic cult or an amyloid cult, or maybe both? Um, there's also storage diseases that we can see with glycogen storage, mucopolysaccharidoses, and single, single lipidoses, which I can never pronounce, and I probably massacred it again. But the differential diagnosis of hypertrophic, cardiom of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or thick walls is always, th is always broad. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because it is relatively common compared to many of the other things. Hypertensive heart disease, very common in our patients. Um, and you can have valvular or subvalvular aortic stenosis that leads to thick walls, but that's going to be relatively obvious. Athletes' heart comes into the differential. Infiltrative cardiomyopathy, I've already mentioned, renal disease. And then many of these X-linked things that are very unusual to see in an adult population, but I will say Fabre's and Noonan's disease may end up in your adult clinics. So those are two that we need to be aware of. And the Noon's, I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but I think Dr. Warrens may cover it. Uh, on Thursday. In Febreze, we screen for that regularly. And then there's medications, hydroxychloroquine uh, can lead to thick walls and diastolic abnormalities and cardiomyopathy. And there's been question about some of the immunosuppressive agents, but that's uh, still not completely worked out. But certainly in children, tacrolimus has been shown to cause hypertrophy or thickened walls. So tools in our differential, our toolbox includes our family history, our history of the patient, and the family history is incredibly important. It needs to be a detailed longitudinal family history of first degree and even second degree relatives. You're looking for a common link. Many of these things are genetic based, and so you're looking for has an, someone else been diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or maybe one of these other rare X-linked type of diseases. Our physical exam, of course, I won't have time to go into all the details there, but I think some of these are obvious. EKG and chest x-ray is part of the physical exam. And then routine screening for thick walls, I would um, look for proteins in the urine, a CBC with differential, alpha galactosidase looking for Fabre's disease, which is rare, but in, we don't want to miss it, and you've already seen a couple cases, and free light chains, which are inexpensive and easy to get, and I'm sure Martha will talk more about that, and then serum protein electrophoresis with immunofixation, and she'll emphasize that again, so I won't go into detail. And then our imaging would be echo, MRI, technetium, PYP, and PET scanning, PETs primarily for sarcoid, uh, and then our cardiac biopsies and genetic testing. Genetic testing can be very helpful, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I'm going to now take a case-based approach to, because you guys are all very sophisticated, seasoned cardiologists, and see what you think about these and see how you might work through this. So here is a 20-year-old African-American football player and uh, P.J. Fleck leading the team out of the tunnel, hiding his number so we don't know who this is for HIPAA regulations. He was a uh, tight end. He had some palpitations. He had a long history of having palpitations and some syncope, but he would never actually sought um, uh, at medical advice until he actually had syncope. And then the team doctor said, you need to get you know, more evaluation. He had one family history with uh, one family member with a possible history of sudden cardiac death. He was a large gentleman, and he was somewhat hypertensive. His carotids were brisk, but not clearly bifid on examination. And at rest, he really didn't have a murmur, but with Valsalva, there was a prompt early murmur in the strain phase of Valsalva. Here's his echocardiogram. You can see here that he's got clear. Uh, 
asymmetric septal hypertrophy with a uh, systolic anterior motion. And when you put the color on, you can see the turbulence in the left ventricular outflow tract. You can see the posteriorly directed jet of mitral regurgitation. And he's hypertrophied in a lot of his walls, but he's asymmetric septal hypertrophy. His left atrium is not significantly enlarged, and he has mostly anterior, systolic anterior motion. Yesterday, I showed, we, I think the day before, we showed that sometimes a posterior leaflet can also be pushed towards the septum and participate in SAM, even though classically, we do think that that tends to be related to uh, the anterior leaflet. Again, his walls are quite thick. Uh, almost three centimeters, and you can see the fluttering of the right cusp, uh, the posterior cusp, or which probably is the left cusp here, really doesn't show very well, but you can see that there's mid to late closure of the aortic valve prematurely. And with Valsava, he gets a gradient of 92 millimeters of mercury, and he has significantly reduced strain on the bullseye pattern. So go ahead and vote. What do you think he has? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Fabre's disease, amyloid heart disease, or athlete's heart? Okay, and I, I would agree, this, is a, this gentleman has a family history. Uh, we dug deeper, and in fact, he did go on to get some genetic testing and did have uh, a genetic abnormality that is consistent with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So again, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, his walls are almost three centimeters. He's got massive hypertrophy. There's really very few athletes would ever, ever, well, there's no athletes that would get into that range, and I'll show you that later. And he has no other clear, obvious uh, abnormalities that would be consistent with uh, with his thick walls being presenting like this. And we had cooperation. I didn't show his MRI, but a strain certainly cooperated. It was low in the area of hypertrophy, which is how we see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Their strain will be down in the area where their walls are thickest. And he had an MRI that was cooperative with uh, delayed gandolinium at the insertion points of his right ventricle, which is classic. And then he went on to have genetic analysis, which was positive. Here's another uh, case that we will see commonly in our practice if we look for it. This is Edna, um, again, a patient of Rick Nishimura's who is 79 years old, a cute little lady, and here she is sitting at the uh, hot dish club at church. And just to be sure you know what a hot dish is, does everyone know what that is? I think I explained it last year. Does anyone want to volunteer to remind? Did you try it over the last year? So basically what a hot dish is is Minnesota. You go into your refrigerator and you kind of look at everything in the refrigerator that might go bad in the next week. And you say, okay, this can't go, we don't want to waste food. So what we're going to do is we're going to boil some noodles, any kind of noodle, it doesn't matter. Usually they're just the flat little wriggly ones. And then you throw all of that stuff that's going to go bad over the weekend in top of the, you throw some cheese on top, a few little crumbled up uh, Ritz crackers, and you stuff it in the oven, 350 degrees, an hour, hour and a half later, take it out. It's very, very good. Not good for your heart, but good for you. Good for dinner. So she had hypotension following a hip replacement. And here's her echocardiogram. So you see, in this case, she does have systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve apparatus. She has a fluttering of the aortic valve with probably premature closure. I'm not going to show you that. Turbulence in the outflow tract. And that posteriorly directed jet of mitral regurgitation. But her, her septum is much, not much as thick as the gentleman I showed you earlier. And it has this uh, basal septal bulge with a kind of a sigmoid septal configuration. And so we go ahead and use the Doppler uh, through the LVOT, and you can see this late peaking dagger shaped um, LVOT gradient, which was 118 millimeters of mercury. So go ahead and key in your answers for this. What do you think the Edna has? Does she have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Fabre's disease, ATTR, ATTR amyloidosis, senoil sigmoid septum configuration, or is, she, is this just a really good question and we need, you know, we don't, can't answer it? See how nice I am giving you all kinds of outs. Okay, most people think it's a senile septal uh, configuration, and I will say that this is a really difficult um, group of patients to deal with. They have hemodynamics, 
of alveolar T obstruction under the right hemodynamic circumstances, but her walls were quite thick. Um, so it is a good question. I think we do, in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic, recognize that there's probably a subset of patients that have the sigmoid septal configuration. It looks a little bit like an S. And they do have systolic anterior motion. Their genetic typing is, is variable. Most of these will not have a positive genotype. In fact, there's a lot of different uh, 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 work that has been done to look at the genotype phenotype correlation and the reverse curve has the highest correlation with a positive gene um, with the neutral septum. I'll show you in the next slide what the statistics are from a study that was done in our institution with the reverse curve being the most positive with about 80 percent being gene positive. But Edna, she probably only has about an 8 percent chance of being positive and it's usually these Z uh, discs that are at the end of the sarcomere that are abnormal. But we, we have a tough time knowing exactly what to do with these patients, so we do tend to treat them if they have the thick walls and if they have uh, this uh, kind of configuration of greater than 15 millimeters of thickness, we do t tend to default into being safe and screen their family members for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Clinical case uh, three now, she, this is a 36-year-old highly trained athlete, competitive in athletics since childhood, a case that uh, Dr. Nishimura saw in clinic. He had been uh, competitive in triathlons, he was CrossFit training, he was now even being competitive in weightlifting. He works out four to six hours per day. I want to say, how does he afford to do that? I didn't ask that question, Rick. How does he afford to work out four to six hours a day? That's a lot. He's he gets up at 4 a.m. <laughs> exactly. He's a trainer. Uh, his trainer uh, recently had, he was complaining of palpitations. He was dizzy after workout, and the trainer wisely sent him to be evaluated in the emergency department. And he had an abnormal, um, a, whoops, sorry. His, he had a very um, abnormal uh, ECG, really not that abnormal, but a little bit of abnormality with T waves and some widening of the QRS. Doesn't show up here very well. I'm sorry about that. And then his, uh, his, his echocardiogram, and you don't see any systolic anterior motion. His LV is a little dilated. His walls are a little thick. His ejection fraction is probably a little bit on the low side. And you can see here, when we actually calculate everything out, that his ejection fraction was indeed mildly depressed. He had a dilated left ventricle at 61, and his upper limit of normal was around 56 millimeters. His wall thickness was mildly increased at 13, and he did have these apical trabeculations. So now you have an athlete who's had some palpitations. He's got some, this, this echocardiographic information. So what are you going to do at this point? Well, I've got to tell you about his E to A ratio was 1.2. See the mitral inflow here. You can see the E to E prime was quite low at 5. And if you measure his A to A, his mitral A to his pulmonary reversal A, he's greater, uh, his, his duration is longer with his A wave going forward. Here's his uh, longitudinal strain pattern, which was normal at greater than 19.5. So here's a uh, competitive athlete with presyncope and palpitations. Do you think he has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, maybe non-compaction, maybe a amyloid or athlete's heart, just based on the echocardiographic information that you're seeing? Okay, most people think he has athlete's heart because we emphasize how much he works out, but a few people are worried about non-compaction with the trabeculations at the base. Is there anything else that you would want? Or are you set? Can he go back? How many people would let him go back and, and exercise? There's a couple people. All right, was there any other testing that you want? MRI, okay, so that's exactly right. So he got an MRI. And his MRI showed no delayed gandolinium enhancement and no criteria for non-compaction. He does have some trabeculations at the apex, but they, weren't, they didn't meet criteria. So what would you do now? Would you let him compete? Would you stop all competitive athletes, athletics? Would you detrain him and follow up in six months to see if his EF gets better, maybe see if his walls thicken back down? Would you, would you do an endomyocardial biopsy? Yes. 
Okay, I'm not surprised there's a lot. So 30% said let them compete. And then uh, detrain and follow up has been kind of the general teaching. I, I think, I think that that has uh, been the general teaching for a lot of these. But you know, how many athletes have you tried to convince to detrain? It's not that easy, oftentimes. So, this gentleman, um, because everything else was was normal, uh, and his he had no delayed gandolinium enhancement. And the only other thing I withheld from him is he had a Holter, which is so PVCs. He had no non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. But I think the um, last year I did the same talk and I showed different cases. We're only we're restrained by 25 minutes, so I tried to show a few, except for Edna. I had to show a few new cases this year. So how thick is too thick? We'll talk a little bit about athlete's heart. So if you look at the Pelica, which has been many times uh, quoted in the literature over the years, uh, looking at trained athletes, elite athletes, you see that only about less than 2% of patients get thick walls more than 13 um, millimeters. But I think uh, many of us who uh, practice in a more diverse population realize that in black athletes is that their walls can be thicker. So there was this, uh, this study that was published in 2008 in Jack, which is very nice and shows that up to 18% of elite black athletes may have thick walls more than 12 millimeters of mercury, 13 and even 14 millimeters. Uh, but remember hearkening back to our football player, he was almost three centimeters. So you would never get into that type of range. I think it is hard if you have a, a black athlete that's in the 13 to 14 millimeters, then that detraining and you're worried about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, becomes very handy to use. Uh, although again, very difficult sometimes to convince our, our very competitive athletic uh, patients that are maybe gonna get a very heavy paycheck if they finish their college uh, athletics uh, to give up that training even for a short time. Size does count um, as the patients get bigger and heavier. Uh, their wall thickness also tends to go up uh, for many of these patients. And uh, so there are some caveats uh, you want to keep in mind that as uh, athletes, that the, there's a size of the athlete that will influence the size of their wall thickness. And we know that the amount of training, so that four to six hours of training, especially if most of that is weight training, is really going to play a huge role in the uh, thickness of the heart walls. So if you look at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at athletes, we can, do, we can uh, discern them. And I'm going to, in your syllabus, I have a more detailed uh, 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 variables that you can look at. But if you look at our patient, these were his. So he was really an athlete's heart. His, uh, his, all of his variables were on the, on the safe side so he could go and uh, compete. But when you have hypertrophy, and this is again courtesy of Rick Nishimura, if you have uh, hypertrophy of the left ventricle and there's a family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if they have a significant wall thickness of greater than 16 or syncope, which is always worrisome, we look at how much they're training. If they're training for less than 10 hours a week, you don't expect them to have that marked improved uh, thickness in their walls. And um, if they have delayed gandolinium on cardiac MRI, then these patients really should not be competing. If they have, if they do have any of these things, then we detrain them and then we recheck at three to six months after they've detrained. If they have performance enhancing drugs, we really just don't know. And unfortunately in today's world, performance enhancing drugs are more common than not. And this is my shout out for genetic testing. I really think that we need to be using this more commonly in our practices. Genetic testing is now available. It's relatively fast. It's relatively uh, inexpensive. Um, the positive test in an athlete can really take, take you out of that realm. Then you can say definitively whether they have it or not. If it's a negative test, we don't know because there's all kinds of um, areas that we're not sure of. But if it's positive, we can say for sure this is risky. And uh, there's a possibility of a false negative because we haven't maybe discovered all the genes, and then I would recommend that you have a genetics counselor involved. This will be in your syllabus with all the detailed uh, work that's been done in athlete's heart versus uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so that you can take a look at that and compare your patients. And again, at the very end of the day, responding to detraining, is, is, as many of you said in the question, is not a bad idea uh, if you can convince your competitive athletes to do that. And then I just went ahead and uh, tried to, uh, because this is an echo course, and I think uh, strain has really been kind of another leap forward to us, and this is really uh, helpful uh, for pa pattern recognition. 
This is the cherry on top where you have significant delayed gandalinium, or sorry, significant uh, decreased uh, enhancement or um, strain at the apex. With hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the apical variant, you can see that there's delayed um, or diminished strain at the apex, so you get this cream on top sort of effect. And if you had a septal, variant, the septum would be decreased in its strain. Hypertensive heart disease will sometimes have reduced strain, but not to the same degree as you would see in hypertrophs or amyloids. And then athlete's heart, the, the uh, uh, global longitudinal strain will be normal. So in summary, there's a lot of things to think about. It's not a, it's a very internal medicine type of a thought processes we need to go through for thick walls. We need to think about the genomics, the morphology, the clinical symptoms, and then, of course, prognosis always comes in. And, and again, we've talked a little bit about uh, the different kind of d differential you need to think about. If you're interested in more about athlete's heart, because I think that has been uh, popular in the, in the discussion in the literature,